uh, some of you, you know that uh, Bourne movies are my favorite, and uh, some of you, they're your favorites too. Uh, this is a clip that comes from the, a movie, Bourne Identity, where an, a spy was sent on a mission, and he failed to accomplish that mission, and as a result of that, he was shot, and they found him on the sea, and when they found him on the sea, what happens is that he completely lost who he was, and the title that, the thing that I wanted you to get is the fact he asked him, what is your name? Who are you? And that man did not remember his name. He did not remember his identity. He did not remember anything about his life. And uh, that's kind of what happens with many people today. Um, when sin comes into our lives, the first thing it goes after is it goes after our identity. It hijacks our identity. It hijacks who we are. And then people do all kinds of crazy, weird things. But what they don't realize many times it's just like born in the rest of his movies when and all kinds of crazy things just to get his identity and to find who he is and we don't have to look any further we can find that today in jesus christ amen we don't have to look any further we can discover that today in jesus christ can somebody say amen we have to understand a few things about our identity is that our identity it affects our perspective i would just challenge each one of you if you're taking notes it's going to be a short and brief, but some things you can still receive today, even from this short and brief um, topic, talk. I believe that you came here, you overcame the cold and the icy road, and uh, God might drop something into your heart today that might bless you in Jesus' name. Amen? Just pray this prayer out loud after me. Say, Lord Jesus, open my heart to your word. Say, Lord Jesus, open my heart to your spirit. Lord Jesus, open my heart to your faith amen one of the things about identity is identity affects your perspective what does that mean it affects your outlook on life you don't see things the way they are you see things the way you are we see things the way we are not the way things are your self-esteem or your view of yourself is what affects how you see other people and other circumstances you know, 12 spies went to the promised land and they saw the same picture. They saw the promised land. But 10 spies came back and they brought the report saying that this is a bad place. We can't conquer it. We are just like hoppers in their sight. And the Bible says this, this is how we were in their sight. The two other spies come back and they saw exactly the same picture. And they said, God is with us. We will go and conquer. The same picture, two perspectives. Why? Because God said about Joshua and Caleb, they have a different spirit. When you have an identity, it affects your perspective. That's why the Bible says we can love our neighbor as we love ourselves. I believe that you can only treat other people the way you treat yourself. Don't take it personally if some people are harsh with you. They are harsh with themselves. Don't take it personally if some people are rude and judgmental and critical and so self-righteous. Uh, remember one thing that's how they are with themselves as well they cannot help but to treat you the way they've been treating themselves all these years amen and if you want to change the way you treat other people or the way other treat the people treat you the first thing that must change is you must change the way you view you because identity affects our perspective we begin to see differently our outlook on life begins to change because of our identity. The second thing about identity is identity affects our performance. Identity affects our performance. Statistics upon statistics prove the fact. Kids who grew up in homes where their self-esteem was built instead of crushed. They do really good in school. They have healthy friendships. They stay away from drugs. They stay away from abuse of, of cigarettes. They stay away from drinking. They stay away from teenage pregnancies. And they stay away from dropping out of school or dropping out of college. Their lives, eventually, they have marriages that don't fall apart. And they have lives that are healthier. They perform better in their jobs. They perform better in their school. And if you will, statistics have been done also that people many times who find themselves in abusive relationships are not people who are ugly. They're not people who are necessarily come from broken homes, but they are people who have broken self-esteem. 
And the reason why they will stay in an abusive relationship, and the reason why they cannot stay in school, and the reason why alcohol, drugs, and all of these things are like, like, like a magnet, just pulls them into those things. It's not necessarily because they don't have like other self-control or New Year's resolutions that I will not smoke. Or they don't never make promises to their parents saying, I will really stop this thing. No, no, no. It's, they've done everything everybody else has done. But they don't have the power to live those things because they don't have self-esteem. The identity. If you want to improve your performance, you got to improve your identity. Identity is the beginning of our behavior. If somebody wants to change their behavior, it does not start with making a New Year's resolution that I will stop smoking. It starts with making New Year's resolution that I will find who I am in Jesus Christ. When you discover who you are, my friend, all of these things, they begin to fall into place. It's not even, I'm going to improve on my grades. How can you improve on your grades? How can you have new grades with an old you, with an old identity? The identity has to improve. The identity has to change. You have to discover it in Jesus Christ. Would somebody say amen? Do you agree with me? I would uh, open with you to write down the scripture or you can go with me to John chapter 1 and verse 19. John chapter 1 verse 19. And I'm going to read. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem and asked him, who are you? Turn to your neighbor say, who are you? Turn to your other neighbor say, who are you? Verse 20, he confessed and did not deny. He confessed and did not deny but confessed, I am not Christ. Say out loud after me, I am not Christ. You should say that more often to your parents. Just say that more often to your friends. Some of them were like, we knew that. We just were not sure if you knew that. Verse 21, and they confessed to him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they asked him, who are you? Say again, who are you? Who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, and most of your Bibles start quotes. It quotes Isaiah. He says, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the ways of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said. I will just give you three components of positive self-esteem or identity. We use the Christian word, the identity. Number one, and it's just answer, it's just three questions that uh, Elijah, uh, that uh, uh, Bapt uh, John the Baptist was asked. One is that he says, "I am not Christ." So the component number one is this: there is a God, and you're not Him. There is a God, and you're not Him. Elijah, uh, not Elijah, John the Baptist was asked the question, "Who are you?" And he said, "Did not deny, but he says, I am not Christ." He knew clearly and completely, I am not God. What, whom you're expecting, whom you're anticipating, who you want to see. I'm sorry to disappoint you, wonderful Pharisees, but I'm the wrong guy. I am not God. You may say, Vlad, I don't think I'm God. You have to understand, Satan did not become Satan for trying to become Satan. Satan became Satan trying to be God. Adam did not become fallen Adam by trying to become fallen Adam. Adam became fallen Adam by trying to become God. Ever since the fall of Satan and the fall of Adam, men have always tried to take position of God in their life. And what happened to Satan, what happened to Adam, is what happens to any man who attempts to, pro to promote and to put himself in the place of God in his life. We miserably fail. You may not walk like the Pharaoh of Egypt, call himself God. But how many times we take control that only belongs to God? How many times we try to fix the parts of our life that we know we cannot fix, only God can? How many times we try to heal the wounds that we only know not time and not ourselves, only God can? How many times we try to judge or we try to do certain things that only belong to God, but we take control of it. The first component to identity or to have a good self-esteem is this, is to know there is a God and I happen not to be Him. 
Oh, how more, how freeing for some of us it could be to know that you're not God. When people don't worship you and you're fine with it. When people don't give you the honor, the, the accolades and the applause that you deserve and you're completely fine because you're not the object of worship. You're not God. How many of us, we love to pray prayers like, oh Lord God, give me a heart of a servant. And then when you get treated like a servant, you leave the church. When you get treated like a servant, you're like, I rebuked that devil behind that pastor today. Who, that person stepped on my toe and we become so irritated. Why? Because we love that notion that we are not God. But the moment we, we hate the fact of yielding the control to somebody else who will tell us what to do. We love to be told we determine what we do with our life. We make the decisions. That's what makes us God. Remember, the national religion of hell is not Satanism. It's pride. National religion of hell is not worship of Satan. It's worship of self. Sata Satanism is not about worshiping Satan. It's about worshiping me. You and me. Jeremiah 17 says, blessed is the man who puts his trust in God. And then it says, blessed, cursed is the man who puts his trust in it doesn't say cursed is the man who puts his trust in Satan or occultic powers. He says cursed is the man who puts his trust in himself. The competition for God in your heart is not Satan. It's you. The competition for God in our lives is not the devil. Most of us are not choosing, oh, am I going to trust God or Satan today? Come on. Is that the competition for God in our hearts? Of course not. Maybe you know if you were in other countries but for most of us here that's not the case for most of us it's between me or God it's whether I have control or he has control whether it's my will or thy will that's the real battle there is a God and you're not him turn to your neighbor say there is a God turn to the other neighbor says and you're not him come on say it with a little bit more boldness say there is a God and turn to the other neighbor say mm, you're not him can somebody say amen? amen? When you live with that reality, something happens. The key to success becomes not striving, but surrender. When there is a God and you're not Him, then your, your secret of life is surrender, not striving. When you are the God of your own life, the key of your success, you got to educate your God. You got to train your God. You got to build your God and you got to force every other little subject around you to worship your God. Can you imagine how hard it is to go and convince everybody to worship you who don't want to? And then you got to punish them and promise them certain retaliation for that. And at the end, you inherit hell for being your own God because God is not going to take you to his place. He doesn't share glory with no man. There is a God and you're not him. That could set us free. For some of us, that could set our whole identity on fire for God. You want to have an identity, it starts with this. John the Baptist started with this, says, there is a Christ and I am not him. He's my cousin, but that's not him. You're not looking at Christ. I would love to be Jesus right now. I would feel sometimes I could be like Jesus because the whole Judea and Jerusalem is coming and get baptized. It's a really awesome position and you guys maybe think that I am Christ, but I am not Christ. And another thing that I want to add to this one first component is this. Sometimes we know that we are not God, but other people don't. Sometimes kids don't know their parents are not God. Because kids begin to expect out of parents what only God can be. Sometimes a spouse does not know that her husband is not God. Because the spouse begins to expect out of her spouse what only God can be. God will never allow your parents to love you so much that will cause his presence not to be needed in your life. God will never give you such a wonderful husband, romantic, successful, handsome, built, powerful, all of these great things that will cause you not have an ache for God. The most amazing Christian, wonderful, successful, prosperous, handsome or beautiful spouse will still never fill the void where God can only fill. Can somebody say amen? amen. There is a God and you're not him. 
that there is a God and I am not him. This brings marriages together. This brings kids and parents together. When kids look at parents and realize you're an awesome mom and dad, but you're, you're a horrible God. When a wife look at the husband and says you're an awesome husband, but you suck at being God. And I'm okay with that. Because you're not God. He is God. And he's not my husband. He is my God. But you are my husband. And when things go in their places, marriages flourish. We flourish as people because our identity rests on a solid rock. Our identity rests on the proper revelation. There is a God and I am not him. Amen? Component number two. The component number two comes with the question when they asked John the Baptist. They said, so, okay, you're not Christ. Are you the Elijah? And this was a perfect opportunity for John the Baptist to say, uh, sort of. Because John the Baptist was as weird as Elijah was. John the Baptist, the Bible says, carried a leather belt. That's where leather belts became famous from. <laughs> John the Baptist generation. He carried a leather belt and he ate locusts. He was kind of one of those people that um, he was not very social. Socially awkward. Eating locusts and wild honey and just come not being with people. And um, radical, very radical in his messages. He was not playing around. He wasn't the Joel Osteen of his day. He wasn't like, you know, nice and smiley. He was brutal and radical. And actually the Bible says that God will send the spirit of Elijah before the coming of Jesus. And when Jesus came from the mountain, he says that Elijah came. But they did to him what they wanted to do. He was talking about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist did have a spirit of Elijah. But he said, I am not Elijah. I may look like Elijah. I may want to be like Elijah. I know Elijah is very popular in your circles. You guys really like Elijah. You're expecting Elijah. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not him either. The second component to an identity in Christ is before you can know who you are, you have to be for certain who you're not. You have to know for sure who you are not. Many Christians, they find themselves wanting to be like other people. And they find themselves dying cheap copies instead of living originals in the presence of God. The Tenth Commandment doesn't say, thou shall not smoke weed. It says, thou shall not covet. Because one of the things that we as humans struggle is this, is we struggle with comparison. We hate it when our parents compared us with other kids, with other siblings. When they said, couldn't you be a little bit more like Johnny? Couldn't you try a little bit more harder like your sister? Couldn't you just, just take care of your room a little bit more like your brother? Couldn't you be as zealous for God as this brother of yours or that cousin of yours? And when you live your life compared, you immediately resent your parents for that. How many of you did not like when your parents compared you? How many of you, your parents did compare you? I mean, some of you are like, my parents are here. I'm not raising my hand today because <laughs> I want to be driven home without a lecture or my mom is watching. We all have. Some of you, uh, your parents compared others to you. It's also evil because it doesn't bring much good. That's one thing. It's what parents did. But the rest of us usually end up comparing ourselves to other people. They say, you know, why is grass greener on the other side? You have to always understand that whoever has a greener grass has a higher water bill. They pay more for water. Whoever has a green grass is he who waters the grass. If you always envy your neighbor, the way they look, the way they are in school, the car they drive, the way they are spiritually, and maybe you wish you could be like them. Remember, the only reason why they are like that is because they don't wish to be someone else. If they would take as much time as you do trying to be someone else, they would never be worthy of wanting to be like. People who are an example for others to imitate are the people who first destroyed the desire within themselves to be like someone else. And they said, I'm going to be who God called me to be. And I'm going to be the best version the world has ever seen. Because this version only comes once in the entire universe. And I have the honor and the privilege of carrying this version and bringing it to the fullest capacity for the glory of God. We're not called to fit in. We're called to stand out. 
we're not called just to be popular we are called to be original and we are called to stand before God and to give him the glory for what he created can somebody say amen the second component is that before you can know really who you are you must know who you are not the challenge with this point or the challenge with this truth is this when people you usually hear that they're like yep I knew it my desire and my calling is to play video games all my life for the glory of God I am meant to be me I like not to put my bed together and clean my chores this is me this is who I am and I don't like to be like nobody else I hate school I hate studying I don't like reading I don't like this I only like playing ball and that is who I am and you dare not touch my identity there's a problem with that little identity Romans chapter 12 it says that we should present our bodies as living sacrifices to God and we should not get conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind what that means it's possible to be so conformed to the world that you actually started to believe that's who you are it's possible to be so conformed to your friends the culture and our surroundings that you believe that is actually who God made you to be how many times talking with guys who um, have found themselves in a gay lifestyle and the, the biggest challenge with that is not that they don't love God it's not that they don't love the church it's not that they don't love people it's not that they're not good people wonderful people but somewhere along the line a man got conformed or a woman got conformed to the fleshly desires the culture the fact it's legal the fact it's popular the fact everybody says it's just an alternative lifestyle the fact that I feel it I like it it feels good when you become conformed to the world you're stopping the work of the Holy Spirit to transform you into the image of Christ Jesus Christ wants to transform us into his likeness but he cannot transform us into his likeness until we decline the conformation to the culture or people around us and many times when we come to church we don't come already as an identity because the things we are conformed to because we've had them for so long it feels like us it feels like part of us and when somebody says anything about that part you say that is me you're fighting God part of me you're fighting my identity you're not fought against your identity it's against the layers and the labels and the garments of things that we are unconformed to that we be made our own the Christ says I cannot transform until you stop being conformed can somebody say amen remember David before he went to fight Goliath the Bible says that uh, Saul came to him and says David you, you don't look good I know you killed bear and the lion but this is not gonna look good in front of a Goliath could you please take my armor and the scripture says the Saul kind of pressured his armor upon David and he put the armor upon David the armor looked really good the armor was shining the armor was popular the armor made him look like a soldier but the Bible says and David tried to walk in that he got conformed to King Saul he tried to walk in that and the Bible says it did not fit good it probably felt good but it didn't fit good sometimes I ask friends who, who I have who live in a homosexual lifestyle and I ask him does it fit good they say no I said does it feel good they say yes David said it doesn't fit I know just doesn't fit me I know I'm gonna really disgrace him by removing this but if I want to have him I have to get this off of me this is not me I'm not hating on him I just cannot walk into a battle being clothed with something that's not part of my identity because I may look good I may feel good but I will die in the battle you want to live in order to live and have victory as Christians we have to make a decision I will not be conformed I will be transformed oh great king to your gods we will not bow and to your idols we will not serve 
we will die if we need to and our God is able to save us but even if he doesn't we want you to know we will not bow God is raising up a generation who are passionate to be more like him and allow him to transform them into his image but he cannot do anything of transformation until I decline the offer and sometimes the pressure of my past the pressure of the things I went through the challenges the abuses and sometimes you know you find girls or even girls for example and they say I hate man he said that is not who you are you were abused and the cloak of abuse was thrown at you but you because you wore it so long and it kept you warm when it was cold it kept you warm when things were really difficult and now you adopted this coat as your skin you made it your own you can't be transformed until you get refusing the conform the conformity of whatever you came from whatever was placed on you maybe your grandma carried this coat Maybe your great-grandpa, maybe everybody in the family lived poor, never finished college, always had divorce, always were addicted to this substance. Everybody had it like that. And this code was handed on to you and you say, this is who I am. That is not who you are. That is what something you struggle with. But who you are is who God says you are. Who you are is what the Holy Spirit wants to transform in you. But he cannot transform until we refuse to conform to either our past, our surroundings, or what people put on us. In Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? Let's bring this message to the end. The third component. So the first component is there is a God and I'm not like Him. And I'm not Him. The second component, in order to know who I am, I must know who I am not. And what that means is that in order for God to transform me, I have to refuse to be conformed. I have to decline the offer of Saul. And I have to say, you know what, thanks Saul, but no thanks. This is not for me. I want to be victorious, not just be a people pleaser. The third component is they ask John the Baptist, you're not Christ. You're not the prophet. You're not Elijah. Who are you? And the Bible says, and he said. And he didn't say, my name is John, the son of Zechariah. He didn't say, I am the priest, the preacher, and the revivalist of a new age. He didn't say, I am a mighty man of God. He didn't say, I am a weirdo from Jerusalem who happens to like to eat weird things. He didn't even say his name. He didn't say his profession. He was at the peak of his career. The whole Jerusalem and Judea came to hear him preach. He was as popular as once a year we have boat races here. You know, and sometimes they say the whole city goes to see the boat races. We know not everybody goes to see boat races, but so many people go to see boat races. It's, it's the event of the Tri-Cities. It's the event of the year. That's exactly what happened when John the Baptist was there. Everybody went to see John. John was the cream of the crop. John was the top dog. John was so popular. And if you would come to interview him, you probably would ask him, so John, what do you do on the weekends? John, what sports do you play? John, what movies do you watch? John, uh, who is your favorite prophet in the Old Testament? John, what is your favorite psalm from David's, David's psalms? John, how do you pray? Hey, John, uh, what do you do? When do you go on a vacation? You would ask all of these, like, you know, awesome questions of a, a very powerful celebrity. And they asked him, John, who are you? And John gives them this answer. He just quotes Isaiah. Never gives him his name. Their, his name never gives them his profession. Never gives them how many people got saved in his ministry. He never connects his identity with his success. Never connects his identity with his profession. Never connects his identity with his upbringing. Never connects his identity with his past. He connects his identity with the Old Testament. He says, I am who Isaiah said I am. I am who Apostle Paul said I am. I am who Apostle Peter said I am. I am whom Jude say I, said I am. I am who Jesus said I am. That is who I am. The success faded one day and they locked John in the prison. And eventually they killed him. But even at that moment, Jesus said, no greater prophet was born except John. Why? 
Because any man who connects his identity to God when he is on the top or when he is on the bottom, he is highly esteemed in the eyes of God. Jews esteemed Elijah. Heaven esteems John. Jews esteemed Moses. There are movies made about Moses. There is not much movies made about John. Three and a half years or three years of ministry, not much preaching, not much success, not much disciples remain after him. But heaven has a high esteem of a man who in the middle of his high time, he still linked who he was, not to his success, not to his name, not to his dad who was a priest or mom who was a holy woman, but he linked his identity. This is what God said and this is who I am. This might not be popular today, he said. This might not get me a lot of applause. I might not get, have a trophy or be one of your great prophets. But listen, I am who God says I am. In conclusion, there are two benefits of linking your identity to Christ. One is you become a voice. He said, I am a voice. When you link your identity to Jesus Christ, you're no longer an echo. You're a voice. You regain your voice. You regain your voice in prayer. It is easy to pray to God when you know who you are. It is easy to speak to the devil when you know who you are. It is easy to speak to your mountain when you know who you are. It is easy to see Goliath because you have a voice. When you know who you are, there's one thing that comes with it. And sometimes people will not appreciate that. But one thing that you will sense is there is a voice inside of you. There is a voice inside of you and the voice says, make straight the paths for the Lord. You begin to speak into your life. You begin to speak out of your life. And the word of God lives in your mouth because you have a voice. We have a generation today who have diplomas, but they don't have a voice. We have a generation today who have careers, but they don't have a voice. We have young people today who have looks, but they don't have voice. Because the moment the worship comes, nothing comes out of their mouth. Nothing. You see the words. You know how to read. But there's no voice. The moment the time comes to come against the enemy, they shiver. Or they think this is just weird. Not because you don't believe it. There's no voice. The moment the time comes to confess God's word, there is no voice. Why is there no voice? Because your identity is connected to your image in the mirror. Your identity is connected to your paycheck. Your identity is connected to what you see on the weight scale. Your identity is connected to your great report. Your identity is connected to what people think about you and how many people like the picture on Instagram or like to post on Facebook. Your identity is connected to something else than the Word of God. And when it is connected, one thing that happens, we lose our voice. We lose our voice. We lose our voice in prayer. I'm not trying to preach it down on anybody. I've seen that in myself. When I withdraw or disconnect my identity from the word of God and I connect it to the fact that I'm this or I'm that, very soon my voice, I begin to lose it. I begin to lose it. John the Baptist said, I am a voice because he connected who he was to who God says he is. The second benefit is John the Baptist said, at the peak of his career, at the peak of his ministry. He said, hey, I just want to let you guys know, the best is actually coming. He says, yeah, I'm baptizing people in water. He says, the guy who is coming, he's going to do it in fire. He says, the greater one, he's so good and so powerful and so amazing, his shoelaces, I'm unworthy to untie. <sighs> it's so good. When you connect your identity to Jesus Christ, your best days are always ahead of you. When you are on the bottom, like Joseph, when you're connected to who God says you are, listen, you're looking beyond the prison because you know your best days are not behind you. Your best days are not now. Your best days, they are ahead of you. When you connect yourself to Jesus Christ and even things are going great and maybe you're afraid, you're saying, you know, things have to go bad. I really feel like they could just one day just break down and I will just have a bad day. But John says, no, 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 no. The best days for Israel, the best days for you, all of you guys are still ahead. 
because I am connected to who God says I am. I want to speak that over you today in Jesus' name. Your best days are yet to come because you will connect your identity to the Word of God. Because you will say with John the Baptist, who are you? You will say, Isaiah said, no weapon formed against me will prosper. You will say, Paul said, I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me in Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. Did you receive something today in Jesus' name? Amen. amen. In the conclusion of this message, I want Bryson to just come up and 